of the complete and absolute destruction of the total being. Buddha himself pointed out that this was not true, but Western folks, particularly uh, those of various religious denominations, chose to misunderstand him. The mind, which has therefore been regarded as so extremely noble, is only noble when it is nobly employed. The mind cannot employ itself. The mind cannot decide value. It can only analyze, compare, and try to determine that which is advantageous. The mind does not discover right and wrong. It discovers convenience and inconvenience. It does not show the way to the nobility of the being, but it can help him to scheme his way uh, to some lofty spot in the material pattern of life. The mind is essentially a material thing, and the only way in which it can come to life is when it is vitalized by the heart. Now, if we can get these two rather difficult instruments into partnership, we have achieved a great deal. But at this time in our world, to create such a partnership is extremely difficult. We have the individual unable to contact his own heart core. One of the old rules of Rosicrucian manuscripts shows the heart consisting of, a, of an organ uh, enclosing three worlds, three concentric spheres. These represented the layers of the heart, or the levels of heart function. In the very center, of course, was the symbol of the sun, the life giver, which is deeply and eternally enthroned in the heart. Outside of this were the, were the various circles of the conditioned heart life conditioning which represented the two processes under which the heart is forced to operate. One, the, the desire or the infinite law which says move life into manifestation. And the other, the finite will of man which says take life and use it only for the advancement of physical existence. This conflict uh, is a very important thing in trying to understand the levels of heart because heart does give us also the energy by means of which we remain physically embodied creatures. When the heart gives up, that is the end. And sometimes as we study these problems, we wonder that it does not give up sooner. The mind burdening the heart is responsible for a whole series of mental tensions, mental processes. Here we have a kind of Gnostic emanationism. The moment the mind uh, attains an attitude, it calls upon emotion to vitalize it. And according to the level of the mind energy, so the reacting level of the heart energy will be. If, therefore, uh, the mind works out an evil conspiracy, the outer structure of the emotional nature of the heart must thereby sustain this conspiracy. The mind says, I do not want to like this, like this person. So immediately the emotional nature moves in and says, I want to feel hate for this creature. If the mind hadn't started it, the heart would never have followed it. But once the mind draws these patterns, the heart energy or life energy has to vitalize them. And whenever the heart energy vitalizes a negative mental pattern, this pattern becomes a living thing. And from a mental attitude of criticism will then come a great emotional surge of dislike. With this emotional surge will come bitterness. 
will come cruelty, will come almost a complete savage indifference to integrities of any kind. Feeling takes over as the negative pole of the heart process. And this feeling becomes, in a sense, the slave of mental purpose. The mind is nearly always involved some way in a conspiracy where it forces the heart into a negative relationship. The individual who has wrong uh, emotional conditions has passed through a process of false rationalizations. A good example of that is the individual who over a long period of time develops an acute self-pity. Now this self-pity does not come from the heart. This self-pity comes from an individual being mentally sorry for himself over a long period of time. It means that the mind has very carefully and continuously overlooked or failed to rationalize anything good that occurred to that person. That the mind has distorted the relationship of that person to others around him. The mind has thrown the personality against life rather than into harmony with it. And once the person has lived under the conspiracy of the mind long enough, we have a good solid case of self-pity which is now open to emotionalization, and the individual dissolves in his own miseries. But he does not start by being miserable in his heart. He starts with a series of very shrewd mental patterns. And in nearly every instance, these mental patterns arose in ambition, selfishness, self-justification, egotism. Or, or perhaps actually a kind of inefficiency which made it impossible for this person to compete effectively with other persons. His dislike for life itself, his growing emotional adolescent unhappiness has been due to the fact that that he has allowed the mind to distort his estimation of himself. The same is true of the hypochondriac. The hypochondriac is not an individual whose fear arises in his heart. His so-called fear began as a series of bad attitudes toward life, towards things. His fear was an intellectual fear. One of the most common of these hypochondriac problems is an individual who has had some kind of a minor heart ailment. It's much more likely to arise with persons who have had minor or moderate heart ailments than those who have really had bad ones, because the bad ones have more or less made their peace with God and man already. But the ones that are just mostly not very sick become our pulse takers. They cannot get their minds off of the possibility that their heart will stop beating. They are totally unaware of the fact that if it ever did stop beating, they would have no time to take their pulse. But this, uh, the individual who reaches in to feel his pulse to find out if he's still alive is one of the most foolish persons on earth. But there are a lot of people who do it. Simply because the mind is presenting them constantly with a certain mental doubt. The mind has given them this whole picture, and after a while, the mind gives way to the emotional stress which it has caused. And the individual begins using his emotions badly, and if he does this long enough, and he does have some kind of an ailment, his recovery will be slow if at all possible. He simply is misusing these powers. The heart has no dislike for the mind, but the heart is the builder. 
the mind is a workman. By using the mind, the heart would like to bring mankind together in peace, but the mind will not permit it. As Jesus said that he would like to take the, the people of Jerusalem to himself, as the hen puts her chicks under her wing, but they would not. The heart sees, senses, knows the incredible beauty that is possible, and the mind settles down to talking the individual out of it. The heart says there can be peace. The mind says, no, I can prove to you there can't. And after a while, the heart gives up but very reluctantly. And even if for a long time the heart is defeated, at the first little glimmer of proof that there might be peace, the heart wakes up and reaffirms its own conviction. The heart's nobilities never die. They are simply balked by debate. And uh, as we know in law, as we know in legislation, as we know in committee, we have nothing accomplished. It takes a dozen persons ten times as long to work out a problem as one individual would require to do it by himself. It means confusion, and with over 40 faculties of the mind in constant debate over the possibility of something, Situations get just about as bad as we see them in modern society. Nations against nations. Uh, men coming together to work for peace, but each one instructed to put his own ulterior motives first. Now, this is the problem in the mind. The mind, first of all, is more directly geared to externals than the heart. The heart has never been able to see a great civilization built on love. Men are able to see, however, a very powerful structure built on mind. Mind can see itself reflected in its own productions, the great skyscraper, the wonderful bridge, all of the scientific researchers, men in orbit, and the, and the mind has a very strong case for its own importance. And the heart has very little to offer. The heart's place in this situation today is about as active as that of religion in relation to science. Science is on horseback. The mind is leading. No one knows where it is leading. No one has, is able to say that it will get there. But in the last ten years, one thing is obvious. The mind has become more and more autocratic at this stage in our civilization, having been given complete authority, which has never previously occurred in history. The mind has taken this authority very much in the spirit of a politician delighted to find that his constituents will are behind him no matter what he does. This is what every politician has dreamed of. So the mind, having found that it is catered to, honored, given every preference, um, given all gratitude and uh, reward for everything that happens, and knowing that it will never be questioned, in this particular generation, has gone power crazy. It, is, it begins to think of itself, and the person who possesses the mind thinks of himself, as a unique child of destiny, and that mind is going to solve everything. Mind has solved nothing. Mind has given us certain physical standards of living, which we are all going to die and leave behind. But mind has not solved any of the great problems of humanity, because it cannot solve them. It is a problem maker, not a problem solver. The only thing that can touch the situation is 
a transmutation, a transformation, uh, a transubstantiation, as it was in the old Christian religion, in which the symbols by ritual are transformed into the living truths which they represent. This is transubstantiation. The great advancements of science, the great accomplishments of mind, must become the symbols upon which a great alchemy will have to take place, and that is the transforming, the transmutation of these symbols into the truths for which they are the Im images or emblems. And this can only be done by life. And life is a heart power. Life must be breathed into these things or they are inert. No one would really dare to assume that a city of skyscrapers is actually alive as far as its buildings are concerned. The only thing that makes the city alive can be the people that live in that city. The city itself as a physical structure is not alive. Therefore, all the works that men have done of themselves are not alive. And in some way, they have to be transformed into living things. And how do we transform a great scientific project into a living thing? We transform it by heart. We transform it when heart achieves leadership and dedicates this structure to purpose. This structure becomes a servant of life when it has received what the Buddhist calls the ritual of the opening of its eyes. And the opening of its eyes means that into this structure is placed a holy relic, is placed a dedicated truth of power, by means of which that which is of itself inanimate becomes in a mysterious way and sold by purpose. Nothing that we create mentally is of real value unless it is ensouled by purpose. The man whom we train to become a great lawyer is not a great lawyer because he is an excellent jurist. He is only a great lawyer when he is ensouled by the purpose to which he is to use his skill. Unless he is dedicated, he is not great, regardless of what he achieves unless the city is dedicated, it is not a great city. Unless a nation is dedicated, it can never remain a great nation. Now, there are different levels of dedication. Some are right and some are wrong. We can say this, that which has no dedication is the shortest lived of all. That which has a wrong dedication but is still dedicated, lives a longer time. And that which is completely ensouled by a true dedication may be regarded as immortal. So it is, this, it is the heart bestowing life that gives life to forms, to gives life to institutions, gives life to trades and arts and crafts. And in giving life, the heart also produces another wonder. In giving life to trades and professions and arts and crafts, the heart gives life to the tradesman, the artisan, and the craftsman, because it is heart that makes him happy in his work. It is heart which binds his consciousness to his job. It is heart which makes him undergo privation for the sake of something beyond himself. The individual who has nothing to live for but himself is the most bankrupt of all. It is always dedication to something that makes life valuable. Dedication to the world, dedication to family, dedication 
to the advancement of some noble cause. Only this dedication which is bestowed by the heart can make the works of the mind and hand a medicine for the person who labors. Thus, as we hear all the arguments and dissensions, as we find less and less of the joy of labor for the integrities involved, we will have more strikes, more problems, more difficulties, until the various factions will devour civilization in an effort to feed themselves. This is mind. This is mind going on, thinking only of how much it can get, how little it can give. The moment the heart steps in, however, this whole process is changed. And in philosophy, we have this great need to realize that philosophy is finally not an intellectual pursuit. The philosophy that has not been ensouled is the typical academic philosophy in which the professor teaches what he has been taught to others who wait hopefully to receive his instruction. Nobody knows, nobody lives any part of it, and nobody cares. Philosophies are systems to be remembered, and if you answer the right way the questions that are asked, you will graduate from the course. This is the problem. This is mental philosophy. The same problem is mental science. Uh, where the, the scientist is concerned totally with the advancement of knowledge. Every new discovery is a great mental thrill. But the use of these things, the dedication of them, the uh, self-control which may cause the scientist to say, I will not reveal this because it is too dangerous to other men. This attitude must come in the place of I will reveal it because it will give glory to myself. These attitudes have to be changed. Philosophy, in order to be meaningful, has to be touched by the heart. It has to become a way of consciousness in which knowledge is used to support the convictions of the heart. The heart is the seed of faith, and it is the mind by means of which faith is justified, and all things that men desire to achieve because of love are made possible because of the skills of the mind. Mind is therefore apprenticed to a power greater than itself. When this occurs, the individual is mentally happy. He is mentally ordered. His life is purposed. Everything which he does gives certain natural, reasonable, proper satisfactions to himself. He is not over-ambitious, nor is he lacking in that consciousness which causes him to labor on industriously for some good beyond profit to himself. The world has always known this. The world has always neglected this phase of knowledge, and civilization after civilization has collapsed as the result always of the victory of intellectual selfishness over integrity. Though the mind in its own nature, according to the Buddhistic system, has to be refined in various ways. The mind has to be gradually relaxed away from the tremendous nervous momentum which it has built up. The great mystery of the mind is centered in the punishments that it bestows upon and receives from the nervous system. The nervous system is like the mind itself, a curiously habit-bound structure. When certain habits have been built the mind of itself does not apparently have the skill to break them. When an individual decides that he is under nervous tension and builds up enough of it, he finds that even when he wishes to relax, he cannot. So having gradually worked himself up into a highly nervous 
and almost dangerously tense situation. He knows no way to cope with it except through some form of sedational drugs. He has no other way. He cannot untangle himself. This is all its own way should tell man the, uh, the misery of his own condition. He should realize that if the mind cannot get him out of the immediate difficulty it has got him into, that it is hardly an infallible process in himself. But when the time comes for this infallibility problem to show itself, the person finds some evasion or just does not think it through. If the mind is what we hope it is, it should be able to regulate the conduct of its own owner. It should be able to convince him of what is good for him. Instead of that, it leaves him the hopeless victim of what is bad for him. So we do realize that the mind, building up these stress-tension processes, has no autocorrective unless some actually valid system comes under consideration. Now in Zen, for example, uh, the uh, thoughtful uh, exponent of this rather dramatic form of Eastern philosophy hit upon an almost fantastic idea, and that is the use of the mind to defeat itself. That the mind, as long as it actually was merely a machine for thinking, if the proper data is fed into it, if the proper patterns are set up in the computing process, the correct answer should fall out of the slot. If, therefore, the mind of man, under discipline, receives certain facts, and these facts are passed through this computing process of the five senses and the coordinator, the individual should ultimately wake up one morning and say to himself, I'm stupid. And this, incidentally, is the only answer he can get, no matter who he is or what he is. If he already knows this, he won't ask the question. He's too wise. If he doesn't know enough to know that he is inadequate, then this is the answer he must inevitably get. He must, therefore, use or sense the possibility of using the mental processes to expose their own weakness. Now, nature has done this also. Incidentally, this procedure, which is technically Zen, is actually a part of what we might term social existence. Actually, everywhere in human society, mistakes have been used to disprove themselves. They disprove themselves by simply failing to work. The situation building up on wrong foundations and remaining uncorrected and continuing to build and compound its own felonies, the thing finally falls apart, revealing itself to have been worthless from the beginning. By this time, of course, the human beings are looking in another direction, hopefully, and do not see the rubbish that is left behind. But it is true in nature and true in man that the mind is relentlessly, subjectively engaged in the process of disproving itself, because that is all it can ever do. If it goes deeply enough, the only answer that can come out of it is that it is inadequate that of itself it cannot do these things. It is like the individual who tries to be an atheist. The atheist is a person who, with his own sophistication, with his own mental attitudes, with his own rationalizations, has deprived himself of the emotional strength of faith. He can do this for a certain length of time, 
But under emergencies, he will ultimately discover that he has de deprived himself of an absolutely necessary strength. And he will finally either collapse or go back to his faith. He cannot escape it. The mind cannot bring him to the goal he seeks. Even though he may remain an atheist to the day he dies, he simply dies not as well as he would otherwise have died. And his future is less certain, at least less immediately secure for him. So in the Zen theory and in Buddhism generally, the concept is to use the mind to, we will say, recover from the illusion of mentality. To let the mind become increasingly aware of its mistakes. It wouldn't take long to make up quite a dossier on them at the present moment in world politics. It wouldn't be much of a problem to make quite a collection of valuable notes bearing to bearing upon the disaster of the intellectualizing of religion, by means of which a faith was broken up into a number of creeds that have never been able to get along with each other. The creeds are the product of the mind. The faith was the substance of the heart. And it is surprising how one faith, which underlies nearly all human believing, can by the mind be arbitrarily divided into hundreds of conflicting creeds, all of which affirm the same thing. So we have the heart, which is a unifying force, constantly struggling against the dissecting uh, factor of mentality. So the uh, Zen and some of the others, rather in Orient, rather like the Wabi quality, as they call it, it's the quality of humbleness, the quality of things very fragile that call upon our sympathy more rapidly than upon our thought. The great work of the great master is intellectually appreciated, perhaps, but some simple thing, like the child's pet, is wobby. It touches our hearts instead. It makes us first warm. And then, perhaps, we contemplate the details. But where the details come first and are analyzed, dissected, broken up, there will never be any hour of warmth follow. You notice the musician, uh, the, the music lover, sitting in the inexpensive seats at the back of a great music hall great to, uh, while a great orchestra plays. Almost inevitably, that person will close his eyes. He will shut out visions. It will shut out the eye symbolism, the symbolism of distraction. He doesn't want to watch all the, music, the violinists sawing away on their instruments. He doesn't want to see the conductor waving his baton about. He doesn't want to observe the lady in the front row fanning herself out of rhythm. He doesn't want to see these things. He wants to close out the world and be aware of the spirit of great music. In a sense also, in mysticism, in Zen, and in other forms of Eastern philosophy, the closing of the eyes becomes a symbol of the closing of the material perceptions in order to permit the soul itself to live without the contaminating influence of being constantly aware of the mental act attitudes of men. We will close our eyes, the world of men disappears. We, and if we, while closing our eyes, open our hearts, the world of God appears. And without this world of God, the world of men does not amount to very much. And when we get this inner sight, this inner uh, tremendous sense of value, then we see how this world of men could be something marvelous, something wonderful, something beautiful. We begin to get the vision of the new Jerusalem, or the mystery of the second coming of the Messiah, or something of that nature. We suddenly are aware that behind 
the mysterious confusions and complexes and web works and snarls which men have fashioned, there is always this sublimity of the world to be experienced only as a great beauty, an almost painful beauty to be accepted into the heart, a heart that becomes so still by overwhelming that it can really be still and know the presence of God. Now the mind is not to discard it in Northern Buddhism. The Arhats do not continue on their lonely paths to liberation. But the fact remains now that the mind in Northern Buddhism has to be civilized. It has to be transformed into a servant of truth. The moment it becomes a servant of truth, your polarities cease. As in all cases, your polarities are illusions. There is really no essential difference in cosmic substance between these various vibrations that in man break up into such distinct patterns. The wonderful friendship of the mind and heart are perhaps, uh, is perhaps best indicated in the symbolism, the psychic symbolism of the anima and the animus. Here we have the great polarization in nature, male and female, mind and heart. And we notice that wherever in society mind and heart lock in a particular crisis, we almost immediately observe a rise in broken homes. We find selfishness intensifying in families. The moment there cannot be sympathies, there will be antipathies. The moment individuals insist upon rationalizing the basic values of life, they destroy them. There is no way of defining the natural affections of man. They can only be experienced. When we analyze them, break them down, try to psychologically put them in little pockets, we have destroyed them. The moment we try to explain why we love or why we do not love, we have lost all value. We have simply become intellectualists. But as man loses the inner directives to build a great world, he loses almost immediately uh, the integrity of his personal affections. Something happens between him and those who are very near to him. Uh, the tyrant who will destroy the world will also destroy his own family, his own home. Overambition will kill the love in a family. It will result in neglected children who turn against their parents. The moment value ceases, the moment things are put onto mental levels, the moment the individual sits down with his little notebook and says, well, if it all goes well in five years and two months, we'll be able to put in the swimming pool. Now, that's all work for this. The whole problem is intellectualized. Life is gone out of that problem. The real problem is not how long it will take us to have things. The real problem is to keep alive the tremendous integrity of the complete joy, the complete fullness of immediate personal sympathy, personal understanding, personal kindness. And as we find civilizations drifting away, as men drift into materialism, as governments drift into misunderstandings, as society drifts into competitive patterns, as we have more disputes and more difficulties and more agitations in every area of society, we find these things become absolutely ridiculously involved. We find today, for example, that there is someone ready at any minute to argue with anyone. All you have to do is express an opinion, and a person who knows nothing about it will immediately contradict you. If you are in any position, if you advance a law in the nation, 
it will be opposed instantly. If you attempt any constructive legislation, it will be opposed instantly. If you try to even be a good citizen, someone will accuse you of not being a good citizen. Because all these people, fear-ridden, hate-ridden, selfishness-ridden, ridden by a false sense of what is liberty and what is right, not recognizing the difference between just laws and tyrannies, not recognizing the difference between necessary controls and unnecessary controls. These people are simply intellectualizing themselves into hatreds, into discords, into miseries, by the simple process of using their own minds to condemn the works of every other human mind. This process goes on, we're going to have a very sick world. And it's not going to be sick because it had to be sick. It's going to be sick because the individual does not realize or has no way, apparently, of knowing about his, his own nature. He does not know that the throne of his life, the source of his life, the one thing which is the ever-flowing fountain of his happiness, his survival, his immortality, and actually through him, the great stream of progress, which is for the healing of the nations, that this is his own heart that when his heart speaks quietly, simply, in those natural ways which are proper and are not distorted by ulterior motives or efforts at self-justification or the nursing of grievances and grudges, if the heart can speak, the heart will speak gently. The heart will always speak from its inevitable love instinct. In catastrophe, our neighbors' houses washed away or burned down, instantly we become human. We're going to do everything we can for that person. He builds his house back again, puts a fence up, and we never speak to each other again. The need brought out the heart. This is Wabi. Our neighbor was not in need when he had everything. But as he stood hungry in his yard with his children, suddenly a heart went out to him, a great sympathy. We had something within ourselves that said, we want to help this person because we sense suffering, we sense poverty, we sense emergency, we sense pain. And our natural instinct is to bring balm to Gilead. So we try to help. And we never expect to be paid for this kind of help. But as soon as things get back into their good old intellectual ruts, we go back to our preoccupations and we are strangers again. But always in man is this heart reaching out to meet the need of life. For the heart wants to love. It wants to serve. It wants to be parent. It wants to respect. It wants uh, to adore something that is great and noble. When this is m missing, it will, de it will deflect its emotions to some unworthy and stupid end. The individual who does not find great things to love uh, will turn his emotional attachment uh, to the most inadequate things. But he must have some outlet and he must have a good outlet. So the heart, by leading the mind, and souls it, makes it purposeful. The mind dedicating itself like the sword of the crusader before the temple altar of his God. The mind dedicated to the service of the heart waits quietly in the sanctum sanctorum to receive the message of the day written by the living finger of God upon the tablets of the heart. Here in the heart is the oracle. And it is our privilege to serve that. But before it can function, we must relax away from the negative and destructive thoughts which cause us to misunderstand our own hearts. 
and we must relax away from those emotional tensions and pressures that cause us to misunderstand our own emotions. These are the false superficial levels of things. And it is only when we are at peace for a moment that the mind discovers how blessed it is to be at rest and the heart says or discovers how blessed it is to adore the Creator and to remember the Creator in the days of our youth and to remember always the wonderful workings of the infinite power which has fashioned all things with love and then has put a mind in the garden as a gardener. The gardener was not true. The mind became the tempting serpent. And from this temptation, man ate of the tree of knowledge, and he has never been happy since. But it is possible for the individual to rededicate himself as a good gardener, to use the mind for what it was intended, namely, to make immediately possible the perfect working of the law, that through the mind we shall reveal the ways and means to glorify truth, to bring truth in its interpretations into our lives. The purpose of the mind is to find applications for principles, not to deny these principles, destroy them, or misuse them, but to find the best uses for the great energies of life, and then, with all dedication, serve these usages, advance them, fulfill them, not for the glory of man, but for the greater glory of the law. If we can understand this, we can create a working partnership where now we have a very terrible feud between management and labor, between all the polarities of life, which we must solve by having orators get up and harangue us. Haranguing, harangue us as Hitler harangued Germany, as Mussolini harangued Italy, as Stalin harangued Russia. And out of all of this haranguing and debating and discussing came only death into the world. So we don't need these things. We don't need to have our minds trained in fanaticisms or to propaganda. What we need is that our mind shall be used to glorify the good in our own hearts, to reveal the love that we have, and to find a thousand ingenious ways to bring love to others and thus contribute to their happiness and well-being. It can be a wonderful team but it hasn't been getting along so well in recent years. It never has gotten along perfectly. But we are wise enough today and old enough in sorrow and experience to do a better job than we have so far. And I hope that each person will try to do just a little better job each day in rescuing love from intellection, rescuing the heart from prejudice, from intolerance, and from all of these things that disfigure man, sicken him. And when the heart gets psychically sick, one of these days it's just going to stop, and the individual who has broken all the rules will inevitably be broken by the rules that he has broken. And we can make a wonderful partnership with life, or we can simply strengthen our partnership with death. If the mind and heart work together, they perfect man. They give him the inner life that makes his hands useful. If they work to cross purposes, man is nervous, irritable, sick, disillusioned, and unhappy. No one can correct this problem but the individual himself. But if he does not correct it, is endangering not only his inner life, but also his daily existence in this world. Well, time is up, and we thank you very much for being with us.